Good afternoon, everyone. In today's video, I'd like to get right back to talking about our futures volatility box setups. Monday and Tuesday of this week were basically forced vacation days for us, given the, the toss outages, which I'm sure a lot of you were facing the problems of. For all of our volatility box members, yesterday I sent out a note letting you know what our game plan is to try and at least stay ahead of some of these issues, as well as what we're doing to try and make things right from our perspective around the volatility box tools. So if you haven't already, just take a look at that note. It should answer all your questions, but if you have any, feel free to email us and we'll get back to you. All right, so today we had trades that really set up mostly in that 11 to 12 p.m. Pacific hour. We had a catalyst, which was the minutes of the FOMC event that came out at 11.07 a.m. And really after that point, we saw we had a series of breaches that took place. We had breaches in the indices. We had breaches in the 30-year bond. Uh, we had a lot of breaches, which we'll talk about in today's video. But to give you a high-level recap, we had seven trades in total today, 57%. So four out of those seven trades were winners for a net P&L of positive 2,639.75 with the biggest winner being silver. Silver was our winner, which accounted for 25.50 in terms of profits for the day. In terms of other winners, we had the 30-year bond, which gave us T1 and T, uh, not T2, excuse me, T1, took off T2 really into the close, uh, where we essentially got two T1s, two seven ticks. In the S&P, we had one trade, which was good for positive 287.50. In the Russell, we had two trades, First one was a nice winner, but the second one we gave back much of those profits where we ended the day up just positive one tick plus commission. So really, this would just be considered zero for all intents and purposes, but I've captured the one tick for those that are curious. We also had some losers. So we had a loser in crude, which was a loss of minus 240. And then we had a loser in copper, which was a loss of minus 400. And so all things considered, still ended the day positive. But of course, silver had a good reason uh, to do with that. All right, so let's get into charts. We'll go through all of these trades today. And I also want to talk about just the NASDAQ and the Dow because we did have breaches there. And I think the price action there is interesting just as a learning lesson and maybe observation tactics that you may be using. The last thing that I'll talk about before we get into charts was the dichotomy that we saw early on in the morning between gold and silver. For all of our volatility box members, you notice we were on the doomsday conservative in silver, but on the aggressive models in gold. And that let us know it was some sort of a hint where I mentioned this to all of our members in that morning note that I expect volatility in gold to catch up, given that we're seeing silver really experiencing greater than usual volatility to the sense that we're actually on our doomsday conservative model. And that's exactly what happened in gold. Towards, I think, the rest of the day, we ended up dropping close to 3% from the absolute highest point. Uh, and so that's where I think you can use some of these clues, really just start Start to pay attention, observe the marketplace, observe what the models are telling you. It's very simple information. It's not hard. It just requires you to actually observe, which then lets you profit from this. Also, for those that were trading options, I think IWM, the Russell options, IWM options, excuse me, in lieu of the Russell futures was about the best play that you had today, where you could try and get something out of the money with shorter dated expiration and really milk that for more than even this $5, which I thought was just another interesting way of doing this. We've been talking a little bit more about shorter dated options, and I think today was just another example of how you can use those in your advantage, take what most people consider to be low probability traits, and turn them upside down where suddenly the risk to reward is now skewed in your favor as a result of being willing to even take this risk in the first place. So I thought that was interesting. We'll talk a little bit about that today as well. All right, so let's get to charts. All right, so starting with the S&P futures, we were on our scalper volatility box first. This is what we sent to all of our members in that note as well. And so using the scalper, if we see in the morning's activity, really we're just chopping sideways, right? And if I actually, uh, before we go deeper into these trades, if we pull up a daily chart, you'll notice we are right near the, the resistance point to take out all-time highs on the S&P. And that's where we really just had a lot of chopping sideways before that ultimate sell-off into the day. So if we come back down to a one-minute chart now, take a look to see what happened uh, just on a micro level. We had our first breach take place in that 11 to 12 p.m. Pacific hour, and this is where price action breached our volatility box cyan line. So this is that first spot in which the S&P becomes interesting for the day. We're looking to try and find levels in which we can buy the dip. Now the scalper, we ended up breaking outside before we got the edge signal. Now moving down the line, we go to our aggressive models, and you'll notice that the aggressive models did a much better job of containing price action. Again, we had the breach, we had the edge signal right here, we didn't hit our target, had an opportunity to re-enter at the cyan line or better. This was the entry, and then the target was hit in this move up right here. Stop was outside of the volatility box. First target was 5.75 points. Then that second contract was moved to break even, the stop. Uh, and that's where we were then targeting our next target line, which is closer to that 33.92 zone. And that, of course, never got hit. We had price action fall back down. And then we all know how the S&P closed into the day. 
Now, similarly, if I uh, cycled through charts where we didn't have trades, just so we can talk about where we also had breaches, the Dow, pretty similar as well, right? The Dow, we had a sell-off into the close. Not really a trade that uh, I find too interesting, 12.50 uh, p.m., but I know a lot of you tend to still prefer trading the close. Now, moving down the line to the NASDAQ, just very similar as well, right? The NASDAQ, we saw more volatility. Again, we broke outside of the aggressive models on the NASDAQ. That then took us to our doomsday aggressive models. And then off of the doomsday aggressive models, still broke outside of that. And so we're still just trying to find a model that works well in which price action has breached our cyan line. We're getting the edge signal right here. And then we're getting an opportunity to enter the cyan lines or better. Now, the reason this retest wasn't a valid trade for me is because we had already hit the first target in this move up. This wick right here had hit what would have been that bare minimum move, which is this level right here. The zone from the cyan line to the edge of the clouds, which is right around 27.5 ish points. We ended up making a move of 27.5 points for again reversing. And so that re-entry retest wasn't a valid trade for me, especially when we had other markets that were giving us better entries. Now, if I move on to the Russell, we'll come back to our scalper models again. Just uh, increase one more time. The Russell looked a little bit different compared to the other three major indice markets. Now, in the Russell, our first trade was a short opportunity in which we had price action breach our scalper line. So this is our most aggressive model. We then had two edge signals. So this was our opportunity to enter. Entry was at the cyan line or better. Had plenty of opportunity to enter at that spot. We really just chopped around sideways. Before then, the Russell really started to sell off from that point for the rest of the day. Now the thing, just if we zoom out here, I know a lot of folks have been starting to use things like IWM options, uh, which gives you the ability to write out some of these waves for longer moves, right? See how much really price action continues to trend. In the case of the Russell, from our point of entry for that day, the absolute best place to short, you'll notice that price action then continued to fall about 18 Russell points or 1.18%. And so that's just an idea for those of you that were trading IWM options. But for our futures trades, that's where our, again, our first target is that bare minimum distance risk, which in the case of the Russell was 2.2 points. Uh, we ended up hitting that 2.2 points. Then our stop was moved to break even from outside of the clouds on that second contract. And we were looking for this gray target line, which was hit a little bit later on, which did take a little bit of time, but we did ultimately hit that target. Now, after we hit that target, we had another breach of the scalper models, except this time we breached and then we really just went away from there, right? We ended up hitting that target before we got that edge signal, which came after price action and already hit T1 almost on its way to T2. So not a valid trade again, did have an opportunity for retest. Again, the idea, the notion of the second retest potentially being an aggressive entry that you may still consider to be valid. The third one, not so much, but even that second one ended up working. Either case, this 11 to 12 p.m. Pacific hour, uh, no valid trades for me in the Russell. It was only the short so far. Now we come into the close, and this is where this was definitely a much more aggressive trade than I think the uh, earlier trade. But that's where into the close, we had price action breach our sign line. Now keep in mind, this is towards that 1240 mark. So we only really have 20 minutes for that follow through, right? Unlike earlier in the day where you still have several hours left of the market being open. In this case, we really just had a little bit of time. Still took that gamble given that we were, uh, that first trade was a really nice trade in the Russell. That second trade also was a nice trade in the Russell. Had a fairly high degree of confidence that this would work, which of course it didn't. We had a breach of our cyan entry line, got the edge signal, but then price action really just continued to go outside of the clouds. No way of really salvaging this trade. It was just a stop out. And so this is where we gave back much of the profits that we had from this first trade and ended the day up just a positive one tick. And so those were the two trades we had in Russell, which really left us at break even for the day in that market. Now let's move on to the bonds. In the bonds, we were on the aggressive models based off of the note we sent to all of our members in the morning. And we'll repeat the same process, right? So the morning, fairly quiet, fairly muted, waiting for breaches. If we keep going forward, you'll notice the first breach came as price action slammed into the volatility box line, but it was just that wick. And then we really had a very quick reversal here. So that was a touch and go, got the edge signal, but really never got that opportunity to re-enter the cyan line, but continued to give us uh, confidence in the models that, hey, this is working the way we would expect it to work. Now, if we keep fast forwarding, in that 11 to 12 p.m. Pacific hour where we had most of our breaches today, we saw that price action then fell in the bonds. And so at this point, we're trying to catch price action. Now you'll notice the volatility box clouds here basically look like a sandwich. This happens when we exceed essentially all of the, the movement zones that we would have expected. Really the easiest layman term way to read this sort of uh, cloud action is that we're seeing more volatility than usual in the bonds and we should switch over from our aggressive models to a model that really does a better job of accommodating price action. And so now off of this, 
If we take a look going down the line, the aggressive, our next model was Doomsday Aggressive, still broke outside of the box before we got the edge signal, right? The first time we got our bullish edge signal, which confirmed that we were now officially in oversold territory, was down here. So we we're still looking for models in which that was supported. Doomsday Aggressive wasn't it. If we come over to the conservative, even the conservative broke outside of the clouds. You'll see that right here multiple times. And finally, it was only the Doomsday Conservative models, which did a good job of hitting the cyan line. Then we had the edge signal an opportunity to enter at the cyan line or better. And very similar to the trade in Russell, off of that doomsday conservative model, you'll notice if I measure this as a risk, it's much bigger than what we typically see, right? Seven ticks in the bonds compared to if I come back to say the aggressive, just to compare this in the aggressive, that was something like three ticks. And so that should give you a notion of, well, how much additional risk are we taking with the doomsday uh, conservative models? But that did end up working, right? We had our breach, we got the edge signal, we had an opportunity to enter at the cyan lines or better. And this was the fill right here. And after that, we saw that the, the bonds had a really nice move up higher. The first trade was good for a positive seven ticks. And that second trade really just came uh, into the close break even. And that's where it was taken off into the close without really having an opportunity to hit T2, even though it looked like we were going to be making a move towards T2. So that was the one trade in the 30 year bond. Uh, and then if we keep going down the line, silver. Very similar as well. I'll stay on the Doomsday Conservative model in silver since that's the one we were using even starting the morning. And off of that, we saw that we had a breach right here. This was the trade in silver in which we had price action hit our sign entry lines. It was the short entry that triggered, not this long. We had the edge signal. We also had an opportunity to re-enter at the clouds or better. And from that point, you'll notice silver really then just continued to uh, fall from that point. We had both our T1 and T2 met. We had the T1, which was first hit. Then we moved our stop from outside of the clouds to break even. Then our next target was at the T2 level with the break even stop, which we ended up hitting in this puke down lower before then silver continued to rally right back up, uh, had a nice little puke. Now, if we zoom in to see what happened in that 11 to 12 p.m. Pacific hour, when all, again, all the breaches came, we saw price action breached outside of the clouds right here just by a wick, but still for all intents and purposes, breached outside of the cloud before we got the edge signal. And at this point, this was the time to stop trading silver, letting us know that we're now experiencing greater than usual volatility. Silver also gave us the hint in gold for all of our members. I included this in the note where originally in gold in the morning, we were on the aggressive models, but silver was on the doomsday conservative model. So there was a huge spread there, which gave us this notion that we expect the volatility in gold to catch up to silver. And if we continue just zooming forward to see what actually ended up happening, we see exactly that happen, right? Very soon after volatility in gold started, started to pick up, excuse me. And we saw gold from the point of that uh, sign entry line right up here ended up falling Actually, let's do it this way so we can actually see that number. It ended up falling close to 3.51%. Again, as we breached up uh, outside of these clouds, that was then our sign to just keep switching outside of these clouds, outside of these clouds, finding the, the models that did the best job of containing price action. And that first one came right here. This is where we actually had to adjust, where coming into even our conservative, you'll notice we went outside of the clouds. Coming into our doomsday conservative, still went outside of the clouds. And after this wick right here, that was our sign to stop trading gold for the rest of the day. So that happened at 8 a.m. Pacific. Now, the next trade we'll talk about is copper. So in the case of copper, if we come back here, copper, we'll start with our aggressive models and just go through the entire process because copper, that first morning test was uh, the thing that gave us the hint. In copper, we saw price action breached our cyan line in that first hour test. And the only model that did a good job of containing price action was our conservative model. Right, if you take a look to see our doomsday aggressive, we breached outside of the doomsday aggressive, but on the conservative, that's where we hadn't breached the cyan line, giving you the confidence that, hey, the conservative models are doing a good job of containing price action. Now in copper, we had our trade come where price action fell into our volatility box cyan lines. This was again, 11 to 12. So this should be very familiar here. 11 to 12 today was the busy period for us, in which price action breached. We saw multiple edge signals. We're still inside of our clouds, had an opportunity to enter at the clouds or as a sign line or better, excuse me. And then really just chopped sideways before price action ended up going outside of the copper clouds. And so that was a stop out in copper minus 80 ticks per contract. Now, the last trade that we'll talk about was in crude, another energy trade, which also stopped out starting off with the aggressive here. You'll notice if we zoom out, starting with the morning, we had that first trade come when price action breached our cyan line. We're waiting for the edge signal. The edge signal came right here. 
Then we ended up making a move outside of the clouds. This is where we got stopped out. If you take a look to see what happened, we really got stopped out for Wix. Not really price action continuing to trend up higher, but just Wix before then price action continued to hit what would have been our first target. And so this was the trade, I think the most painful trade of today, if I may say so myself. It was where really we just got stopped out for Wix. And this isn't what we like to see. This happens every now and then. Uh, not too often, not often enough to really change anything, change anything in our rules, but still frustrating whenever it does happen. And so this is that trade in crude. Again, just uh, no other way to say it outside of just getting stopped out by the wicks. So hopefully this gives you a notion of all the different trades that we had today, but how many of those trades came in between that 11 to 12 p.m. Pacific hour. And for those that are curious about what the catalyst was, if we come to our Forex Factory uh, table right here with the news latest stories, you'll notice at around 11 a.m. was when we had the minutes of the FOMC. And after that is when we saw this increase in volatility in the markets, which led to all of our breaches. So if you weren't looking at the news, you still saw really price action along with our rules on just a pure technical chart analysis level, give you the picture of, hey, there's some sort of catalyst happening right now. We're seeing a lot of volatility in this hour. But again, if you did have access to news, then you see that, hey, what's the reason of this catalyst and how do we then trade this? All right, so I hope this video helps to give you an idea of all the trades that we had for today. Hopefully, for all of you that were dealing with the toss outage, most of the problems are fixed now. Uh, it's been definitely an interesting past few days, but I hope that at least you've taken this time to invest into your trading education if you're not trading on other platforms, etc., to still just continue to improve or at the very least disconnect, get a chance to refresh, reconnect, and come back to the markets with a fresh set of eyes. All right, take care, everyone. Good luck trading, and we'll see you in the next update.